Okay, so this is chapter 25 of the Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks by Rebecca Sklute. Who told you you could sell my spleen? In 1976, the same year Mike Rogers published the article on Rolling Stone, and the Lacks family found out about people who were buying and selling Henrietta cells. John Moore was working 12 hours a day, 7 days a week, as a surveyor on the Alaska Pipeline. He thought his job was killing him. His gums bled, his belly swelled, bruises covered his body. It turned out at the age of 31, Moore had hairy cell leukemia, a rare and deadly cancer that filled his spleen with malignant blood cells until it bulged like an overfilled inner tube. Moore's local doctor referred to him as David Gold, prominent cancer research at UCLA, who said that removing his spleen was the only way to go. Moore signed a consent form saying the hospital could dispose of any severed tissue or member by cremation. And Gold removed his spleen. A normal spleen weighs less than a pound. Moore's weighted 22 after the surgery, Moore moved to Seattle, became an oyster salesman, and went on with his life. But every few months, between 1976 and 1983, he flew to Los Angeles for follow-up exams with gold. At first, Moore didn't think much of the trips. But after years of flying from Seattle to L.A., so gold could take bone marrow, blood, and semen, he started thinking... Can't a doctor in Seattle do this? When Moore told Gold he wanted to start doing his follow-ups closer to home, Gold offered to pay for the plane tickets and put him in the style at the Beverly Wilshire. Moore thought that was odd, but he didn't get suspicious until one day in 1983, seven years after his surgery, when a nurse handed him a new consent form that said, I do, do not voluntarily grant to the University of California all rights I, or my heirs, may have in any cell line or any other potential product which might be developed from the blood and or bone marrow obtained from me. At first, Moore circled do. Years later, he told Discovery, Discover magazine, you don't want to rock the boat. You think maybe this guy will cut you off and you're going to die or something. But Moore suspected Gold wasn't being straight with him, so when the nurse gave him an identical form during his next visit, Moore asked Gold whether any of the follow-up work he was doing had commercial value. According to Moore, Gold said no, but Moore circled do not, just in case. After his appointment, Moore went on to his parents' house nearby. When he got there, the phone was ringing. It was Gold who already called twice since Moore left the hospital. He said Moore must have accidentally circled the wrong option on the consent form and asked him to come back and fix it. I didn't feel comfortable confronting him, Moore told a journalist years later. So I said, gee, doctor, I don't know how I could have made that mistake. But I said I couldn't come back. I had to fly to Seattle. Soon, the same form appeared in Moore's mailbox at home with a sticker that said, Circle, I do. He didn't. A few weeks later, he got a letter from Gold telling him to stop being a pain and sign the form. That's when Moore sent a form to a lawyer who found that Gold had devoted much of the seven years since Moore's surgery to developing and marketing a cell line called Mo. Moore told another reporter it was very dehumanizing to be thought of as Mo, to be referred to as Mo in the medical records. I saw Mo today. All of a sudden, I was not the person Gold was putting his arms around. I was Mo. I was the cell line, like a piece of meat. Weeks before giving Moore the new consent form, after years of follow-up appointments, Gold had filed for a page patent, a patent on Moore's cells 
and several extremely valuable proteins those cells produced. Gold hadn't yet sold the rights to the patent, but according to lost, the lawsuit more eventually filed, Gold had ent entered into agreements with a biotech company that gave him stocks and financial worth. Financial worth more than 3.5 million to commercially develop and scientifically investigate the Mohs cell line. At that point, its market value was estimated to be 3 billion. Nothing biological was considered pat patentable until a few years before Moore's lawsuit in 1980, when a Supreme Court ruled on the case of Ananda Mohan Katrabarti, Katrabarti, a scientist working at General Electric, who created a bacterium genetically engineered to consume oil and help clean oil spills. He filed for a patent, which was denied on the grounds that no living organism could be considered an invention. Chakrabarti's lawyers argue that since normal bacteria don't consume oil, Chakrabarti's bacteria were naturally occurring. They only existed because he had altered them using human ingenuity. Chakrabarti's victory opened up the possibility of patenting others living things, including genetically modified animals and cell lines, which didn't occur naturally outside the body. And patenting cell lines didn't require informing or getting permission from the cell donors. Scientists are quick to point out that John Moore's cells were exceptional and few lines are actually worth patenting. More cells produce rare proteins that pharmaceutical companies could use to treat infections and cancer. They also carried a rare virus called HTLV, a distant cousin from the HIV virus, which researchers hoped to use to create a vaccine that would could that could stop the AIDS epidemic. Because of this, drug companies were willing to pay enormous sums to work with the cells. Had Moore known this before Gold patented them, he could have approached the companies directly and worked out a deal to sell the cells himself. In the early 1970s, a man named Ted Slaving had done precisely that with antibodies from his blood. Slaving was born a hemophiliac in the 1950s, the only available treatment involved infusions of clotting factors from donor blood, which wasn't screened for diseases. Because of that, he had been exposed to the hepatitis B virus again and again, though he didn't find out until decades later. When a blood test showed extremely high concentrations of hepatitis B antibodies in his blood. When the results of that blood test came back, Slavin's doctor, unlike Moore's, told him his body was producing something extremely valuable. Researchers around the world were working to develop a vaccine for hepatitis B, and doing so required a steady supply of antibodies like Slavin's, which pharmaceutical companies were willing to pay large sums for. This was convenient, because Slavin needed money. He worked odd jobs, waiting tables, and doing construction, but he'd eventually have another hemophilia attack and end up unemployed again. So. Slavin contacted laboratories and pharmaceutical companies to ask if they wanted to buy his antibodies. They say yes in droves. Slavin started selling his serum for as much as $10 a millimeter, uh, uh, add up to 500 millimeters per order, to anyone who wanted it. But he wasn't just after the money. He wanted someone to cure hepatitis B. So he wrote a letter to the Nobel Prize winning virologist Baruch Blumberg, who discovered the hepatitis B antigen and created the blood test that found Slavin's antibodies in the first place. Slavin offered Blumberg unlimited free of his use of use of his blood and tissues for his research, which began a years long partnership. With the help of Slavin's serum, Blumberg eventually uncovered the link between hepatitis B and liver cancer and created the first hepatitis B vaccine vaccine saving millions of lives. Slavin realized he probably wasn't the only patient with valuable blood, so he recruited other similar endowed people and started a company, Essential Biologicals, which eventually merged with another larger biological product corporation. Slavin was only the first of many who have since turned their bodies into businesses, including nearly 2 million Americans who currently sell their blood plasma, many of them on a regular basis.
More, however, couldn't sell the Mosels because that would have been that would violate Gold's patent. So in 1984, Moore sued Gold at and UCLA for deceiving him and using his body in research without consent. He also claimed property rights over his tissues and sued Gold for stealing them. With that, he became the first person to legally stake a claim to his own tissue and sue for profits and damages. When Judge Joseph Wapner, most famous for being the judge on The People's Court television show, ended up refereeing, refereeing the depositions, Moore figured no one would take the case seriously. But scientists worldwide panic. If tissue samples, including blood cells, became patients' property, researchers taking them without getting consent and property rights up front would risk being charged with theft. The press ran story after story quoting lawyers and scientists saying that a victory for Moore would create chaos for researchers and sound the death knell to the university physician scientist. They called it a threat to the sharing of tissues for research purposes and worried the patients would block the progress of science by holding out for excessive profits, even with cells that weren't worth millions like Moore's. But plenty of science was already on hold, while researchers, universities and biotech companies sued one another over ownership of various cell lines. Only two of those cases mentioned the people who those cells came from. The first, in 1976, involved ownership of an important human fetal cell, fetal cell line. Leonard Havelick, the researcher who'd originally grown the cells, argued that there were numerous parties with a legitimate property interest in any cultural cell, including the scientists who grew them, the financiers of any related work, and the donors of the original cell. Without any of those contributions, he said, the cultured cells wouldn't exist and neither would any money resulting from their sale. That case set no precedent because it settled out of court, with the rights to the cells being divided between the parties involved in, involved in the lawsuit, which did it include the cell donor. The same was true of another case soon after, in which a young scientist took a cell line he had helped develop in the United States and fled with it to his native Japan, claiming ownership because the original cells had come from his mother. The public didn't realize there was big money in cell lines until the news of more case hit, and headlights nationwide said things like, Ownership of cells raises sticky issues. Who should have the rights to a patient cells? Who told you you could sell my spleen? Scientists, lawyers, ethicists, and policymakers debated the, t the issues. Some called for legislation that would make it illegal for doctors to take patient cells or commercialize them without consent and the disclosure of potential profits. Others argued that doing so would create a logistical nightmare that would put an end to medical progress. Ultimately, the judge threw more suit out of the court, saying he had no case. Ironically, in his decision, the judge cited the Gila cell line as a precedent, as a precedent, for what happened with the mole cell line. The fact that no one had sued over the growth or ownership of the Gila cell line, he said, illustrated that patients didn't mind when doctors took their cells and turned them into commercial products. The judge believed more was unusual in his objections, but in fact, he was simply the first to realize there was something potentially objectionable going on. Moore appealed, and in 1988, the California Court of Appeals ruled in his favor, pointing to the Protection of Human Subjects and Medical Experimentation Act, a 1975 California statute requiring that research on human respect the right of individuals to determine what is done to their own bodies. The judges wrote, A patient must have the ultimate power to control what becomes of his or her tissues. To hold otherwise would open the door to a massive invasion of human privacy and dignity in the name of medical progress. But Gold appealed and won. And with each new decision in the suit, headlines flip-flopped. Core rules cells are the patient's property. Core bagged doctor's right to use patient tissues. Nearly seven years after Moore originally filed suit, 
the Supreme Court of California ruled against him in what became the definitive statement of his issue. When tissues are removed from your body, with or without your consent, any claim you might have had to owning them vanishes. When you leave tissues in a doctor's office or a lab, you abandon them as waste, and anyone can take your garbage and sell it. Since Moore had abandoned his cells, they were no longer a product of his body, the ruling said. They had been transformed into an invention and were now the product of Gold's human ingenuity and inventive effort. Moore wasn't awarded any of the profits, but the judge did agree with him in on two accounts. Lack of informed consent because Gold hadn't disclosed his financial interests and breach of fiduciary duty, meaning Gold had taken advantage of his position as doctor and violated patient trust. The court said researchers should disclose financial interests in patients' tissues, though no law required it. It also pointed out the lack of regulation in patient protections on, in tissue research and called on legislators to remedy the situation. But it said that ruling in Moore's favor might destroy the economic incentive to conduct important medical research and that given patients' property rights in their tissues might hinder research by restricting access to the necessary raw materials, creating a field where, with every cell sample, a researcher purchases a ticket in the litigation lottery. Scientists were triumphant, even smug. The dean of the Stanford University School of Medicine told a reporter that as long as researchers disclose their financial interests, Patients shouldn't object to the use of their tissues. If you did, he said, I guess you could sit there with your ruptured appendix and negotiate. Oh. Despite the widespread media coverage of the Moore suit, the Lax family had no idea any of this was happening. As a debate over ownership of human tissues played out around the country, the Lax brothers continued to tell anyone who would listen that John Hopkins had stolen their mother cells and owed them millions of dollars. And Deborah started handing out newsletters about her mother and the cells saying, I just want all y'all read what's on this paper and tell everybody, bring it around. We want everybody in the world to know about my mother. This is the end of chapter 25.